Um, so hi everyone, uh, my name is Libin, uh, joined with Suchit and Harsha from Isopay. We are the course engineers in Isopay and in this talk we like to talk about low vulnerability, uh, how it affects us, uh, how did, what did we do to mitigate it and the steps we took and uh, share a couple of lessons we learned which we all could use in situations like this. Right. Uh, to, so to uh, say a bit more about us, we are uh, devs equipment engineers from Isopay working in different areas including pen testing, development and operations. Right. Uh, next slide. So uh, during this talk, we like to discuss uh, about what log 4 j vulnerability is, the nature of its vulnerability, the areas affected, um, how did we mitigate it, what are the steps we took, uh, what are the countermeasures we tried, uh, what worked and what didn't, right? Um, next slide. Uh, to say a bit about our company, uh, Recipe is a fintech unicorn uh, startup uh, based out of India. We work in the new banking space, uh, helping customers have their financial efficacy while they they can focus on their business, right? Uh, to talk about, a bit about numbers and stats, uh, we run uh, roughly uh, 600 teams with 600 current engineers, uh, 100 plus microservices of the last year alone, uh, over a wide variety of tech, tech stack, including uh, Go PHP, Python, Java, Node.js, Scala, anything that you name it, right? And roughly uh, 2,000 deployments per month. Uh, all these numbers are just to show uh, how a complex, fast-paced, uh, deployment or infrastructure is kept up and up and running while uh, such a serious uh, security vulnerability occurred. And uh, next slide. So what is what is this all about, right? Uh, we all heard about Log4j unless you are an out in application for like two, three months. So Log4j is a vulnerability that occurred somewhere during December 9, 10 last year. Critical vulnerability, uh, it occurred on a particular framework for logging in Java called Log4j and it causes an RCE or remote code execution. Okay, next slide. So as you all seen, it's been affected by many, many of our enterprise uh, services all over the world, whether it's Amazon, Apple, IBM, you name it, right? Uh, so the funny thing about this is uh, we normally use a logging library to log um, information about application in some cases, whether to know there's an attack or an exception of it. And this vulnerability itself affects the logging library. So whatever you use to log, if there is a malicious payload, the vulnerable library itself will give you an RCE, right? So that's why the memes are there. So next slide. So what's this about, right? So this particular CV named uh, 44228. Um, first disclosed around December 10 last year, causes an RCE in a library called log4j, and they named it as log4shell. And what it enables a hacker to do is to uh, cause a remote code execution, meaning he can send a particular pattern of payload into a service and execute a code into that service causing uh, harm such as um, availability or run some malicious code which bring down the server or extract the data, you name it, right? Now, uh, but why is such a serious issue? Because this is not the first critical vulnerability that we see, right? So um, let's see uh, why, why, why this stands out. Next slide. Um, so we'll talk about four attributes of this particular vulnerability. First one is impact. So unlike many of the previous vulnerabilities that I've seen, uh, log4j is used by most or millions of softwares across the internet, right? Most of the Java-based applications use log4j as their uh, log library. Now, uh, talk about criticality, this particular vulnerability causes an RCE, which let users execute code on servers without pretty much less technical knowledge or any other precondition. So it's a pretty critical issue, which is why it's given CVSS 10. Now, uh, the ease of exploitation. So it's a very simple attack. You can send a very simple payload in, a, in any request and get a post to a server. You can have it in, in its headers or body or any request. And if that message is particular message is being logged by a vulnerable uh, library, it, it can cause the same uh, attack, right? So it's very easy to use, made it very script friendly. A lot of people started using it. We, see, we saw a lot of noise and attack patterns over the internet. And the last one is, is the availability of POCs. Soon after the first vulnerability was discovered, we observed a lot of POCs out there in the internet, which helped a lot of people uh, create botnets out of this. A lot of attack patterns were thrown out in the internet, which were used by script kiddies all over the world to attack many services out there. Right. So all of these four factors combined make this a very serious issue, very critical issue, because as soon as the vulnerability was discovered, we started seeing all of the servers getting hit, people started reporting uh, disrupted services, uh, data being extracted and all of this, right? So uh, next slide. 
So what is this Log4j, right? Log4j is a project from Apache Software Foundation. It's an open source logging framework. It's used by millions of services out there, mostly by Java-based applications. And um, next we're talking about a little bit of technicality here. So Log4j uses a particular lookup feature called JNDI. It's called Java Naming and Directory Interface. Uh, why we should know about it? We'll uh, look at it in the next slides. Uh, next slide, please. So JNDI is an app API framework for applications to interact with remote objects registered with, let's say, RMA registry or a service like LDAP. So a JNDI helps any Java applications to access these services remotely and execute classes or functions that you need, right? Now, why is that such an issue? Because, because from any Java application, you can use JNDI to call services like DNS, LDAP, NAS, and, and many more, right? So um, Log4j uses message lookup in its uh, program, meaning in Log4j, you can call other services, mostly say LDAP, right? Now, why, why this is important? We, you will see it in our demo in next, right? Uh, next slide. Uh, now let's, let me walk you through the timeline of Log4j next. So now, now we go to know a little bit of Log4j library, what the vulnerability is, how it's affecting everything. Let's see what happened during that period of time when this vulnerability was discovered. So at first, the vulnerability was called as a denial of service attack, moderately critical, meaning it was given a score of 3.7. Somewhere around December 10th, uh, the, the researchers were able to further exploit this attack to create an RCE vulnerability, causing uh, a new CV being reported, uh, which escalated the score from 3.7 to 10 or 9. And immediately after Apache Foundation released the first patch, which is 2.16, Soon after the patch, researchers were able to find another further vulnerability, caused them to release another version called 2.17, and soon after another one for 1.7.1. Meaning it was just not one vulnerability that was reported, but a series of vulnerabilities causing multiple patches from 2.15 to 2.17 over a period of two weeks. Right. So uh, from a team's perspective, from a uh, consumer perspective who are using these vulnerabilities, we just didn't have to just upgrade once, but we have to upgrade thrice to have uh, mitigations in place. Right. Uh, next slide. Now, uh, let me walk you through the slides or, or the time that happened around in Razorpay. So around December 10th, at that, that time, we we first started observing the reports about a zero day about a log 4 library uh, vulnerability out there in the wild. And soon after, we saw a spike in our traffic. A lot of anomalies we were being hit or were being sent or requests, invalid requests being sent. And uh, we immediately form a team or, or a one room. I think all of us did um, and to analyze this traffic. And soon we confirmed that these traffics were indeed local j payloads being sent to us. And as with every team, we first applied the uh, managed web rule set. I think AWS released that rule set, which, which, is, which mitigates this particular vulnerability. And but uh, soon after we figured out that this uh, managed rule set didn't work for us, meaning uh, it was blocking certain legitimate traffic. It was also uh, not blocking certain traffic which were um, which have maybe newer variant uh, payloads, right? So we switched from managed rule set to a custom rule set. We started modifying these rule set with updated uh, patterns so that they uh, mitigate these new payloads, new variants. Also allows our legitimate business traffic to go through. And at, at around the same time, we also started looking at the, uh, the assets that we have, meaning how we are impacted from this vulnerability, right? So we use a lot of services which run uh, across uh, different landscapes. Uh, so we wanted to know how many of our services were actually uh, impacted by this particular vulnerability, right? And, and we had little time to do this. So uh, next slide. Uh, so, so to know about log4j, right? So it's not really that easy to figure out whether an application is using log4j directly or whether it's using it directly or whether one of the third parties is using it. So uh, without further ado, we we immediately passed all of our servers with first earlier mitigations which were released, uh, meaning with or without uh, getting affected, there's no time to manually verify all of the services which were affected. So we immediately passed all our production instances. And then at, the, at the, around the same time, we started updating our waffles with uh, Honeypot data. So why that's important will be discussed in the further down slides. 
And uh, soon after updating, uh, patching our production instance, we started packing patches using our asset inventory. So uh, a bit about asset inventory will be uh, explained during me for the slides. So it's in short, it, it, hel it helps us identify uh, which assets uses what kind of components and how they are mapped to uh, different infra components, right? And after that, we start our long journey to patch our services, which are vulnerable to log4j uh, particular attack. Um, next slide. Next, uh, we'll see a demo of how this attack works. For that, I'll, I'll hand, hand it over to my colleague, Sujit. Uh, Sujit, all yours. Thanks, Ruben. So, um, yeah, like uh, how Ruben ex you know, explained on uh, how, how the attack started and the pro you know, it progressed. So, uh, you know, we, you know, let's, let's look into how the attack works. So basically on the technical aspects of, uh, you know, the attack. So, uh, you know, uh, we do have a small, uh, you know, uh, a chart which shows the attack sequence of, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, it starts with identification, uh, uh of vulnerable, uh, service. Um, you know, uh, uh, so you know, uh, basically, the attacker is uh, you know scan scan through the internet looking for vulnerable uh, uh, servers, uh, servers which basically are using you know lock. Feature. So once identified, uh, they malicious payloads um, to the server. Uh, you know, basically in the request in the form of some headers or query parameters. Like as you can see in in the diagram, right? So uh, um, below. Uh, Below the second, uh, uh, you know, entity, you can see uh, a request basically, which have, which is highlighted in red. So that is how the payload looks like. So uh, you know, once this is sent, uh, the victims, uh, victim server uh, uh, logs this particular uh, uh, request using log for So But here is where the vulnerability is. So right. So uh, you know, uh, uh, where you know, log for basically once logged, it varies the uh, malicious LDAP server, uh, which is sent by the attacker. Uh, uh, then you know the LDAP in turn uh, reaches uh, you know or responds to the malicious uh, 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 or the victim server basically with the malicious Java class, which is uh, then you know basically exploited. So uh, <clears throat> so looking at the same, uh, uh, you know basically looking uh, looking at the uh, you know attack, we do have a small demo that we can look at how the attack basically works. So uh, I mean here uh, in this right, we can look at this particular. Uh, 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 screen. So we do have like two terminals running. One on the towards the left basically is uh, you know this part of the screen is basically where uh, a victim or a vulnerable server that is running. Uh, basically, uh, you know a server that is using lock for uh, lock for J. Uh, and uh, yeah, towards the right we can see there is a, a you know a LDAP server that is running. Uh, Basically, this is a malicious LDAP server that you know that is attacker controlled. Uh, basically, running on one three eight nine four. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, basically, you know, uh, we we do know this is a RC. So, uh, you know, for us to identify how the RC works, so here we are uh, running a listener. Uh, uh, basically, listening for ICMP package uh, on this particular interface, Docker or Um. And basically, you know, this is the application that is uh, running uh, or using log4j, um, which is running on localhost 8080. So, uh, looking at this, uh, you know, uh, we so basically the attack is where we where where you know the attacker sends a request to the vulnerable server. Uh, uh, for example, if we look at the uh, terminal uh, on the right, so where we are sending a call request, so we are. We are sending a call request to uh, localhost 8080, that is the vulnerable server, uh, and uh, no, we are uh, we are adding a header XAPA version, uh, which is uh, you know which is basically uh, which which has the payload uh, of you know uh, lock pusher. So uh, the payload is is you know it contains LDAP uh, query where it is uh, uh, sending a request to uh, the attacker's controlled LDAP server with some some you know uh, uh, payload in that which which I'll uh, you know explain what the payload basically is and how, how it looks like. So uh yeah so uh if we look at this payload in the end so uh, this is a base64 encoded uh, payload uh, which basically pings uh, uh, the listener that we are running uh, that is uh, running on one one into one six eight fifty six dot ten right so that is base64 encoded and uh, it is used to hit that uh, vulnerable server. So as soon as you know we hit uh, this uh, request uh, using curl, 
uh, we can observe it on the left side of the screen, which you know where we start getting hits. So this this confirms that you know uh, the payload worked and we started getting uh, you know pings on ping on the receiver. Just to confirm this, uh, we'll try to log into the uh, uh, you know vulnerable server using you know Docker exec. So we can see what what exactly is happening inside. So by a simple uh, uh, PS, you know we can see that ping on this particular IP is it's basically run. So this confirms you know uh, that there was a RC code execution on the uh, Bitcoin server. So uh, yeah, coming back to the slides, uh, we you know uh, we we saw that um, uh, the, how the attack works. Uh, so moving on uh, to the response side of it, like, you know how 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 did we uh, uh, respond to this? So this uh, basically you know we had uh, a, a, a three uh, a three step process where you know we started with a short term, a medium term, and a long term. So the short term we you know concentrated on uh, WAF updates uh, uh, on updating web tools, uh, then adding environment variables uh, uh, to the containers, uh, which will be covered in detail uh, in further slides. Then in, in the medium term uh, uh, response, we did, uh, you know, um, uh, we did use data from a honeypot, uh, which again will uh, go in depth and uh, we did uh, uh, attack simulation. And in long term, uh, you know, it was updating the affected versions and, uh, you know, basically the updates. So, uh, so uh, you know, uh, 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 moving on. So uh, this is this was one of our uh, you know short term goals or a short term response. So uh, where you know we started with uh, uh, it, it it was basically our first uh, an layer of defense. A few few things to talk on WAF, right? We initially went with this, uh, uh, which is AWS managed uh, uh, WAF, which did not work well for us uh, as it was very generic and it did block a uh, few of our legitimate traffic. So uh, you know, as a result, we had to uh, move to a custom rule, uh, custom rule set uh, where you know uh, where we uh, manually uh, we constantly manually updated the rules uh, after our. So we were getting this, uh, uh, you know, the payloads and bypasses from a uh, few online online resources uh, such as Twitter, blogs, and one of our major sources was Sans, uh, you know, a honeypot that was set up by Sans. So. Uh, <clears throat> So uh, you know this. This is how uh, 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 you know uh, our uh, WAP rule set you know looked like. You know how the uh, uh, how how it was updated and stuff. You know these were the rules that we were using. And moving on, like you know talking about uh, uh, updating WAP rules with Honeypot. Uh, uh, so why why did we you know reach here is one of the things. So you know there were a lot of uh, bypasses. I'm considering this WAP, um, and we are uh, using some some sort of patterns uh, to uh, you know to detect it. Uh, there, there will be a lot of uh, bypasses that will be coming, you know, as initially we were relying on WAF, uh, we had to look for bypasses. So based on the payloads and, you know, bypasses, uh, uh, we were adding custom WAF rules to uh, block malicious traffic. So, uh, so uh, for this, we, we, uh, we use SANS honey, uh, data from SANS honey, honeypot. Um, uh, uh, basically, SANS, SANS, you know, had set up a honeypot, uh, which, which had a lot of data uh, coming with respect to the payloads and bypasses. So, uh, talking a little bit on honeypots, um, uh, you know, SANS have set of honeypots. Uh, so basically, these honeypots are some systems which are uh, used to lure attackers, you know, to uh, gain some insights on and info on uh, their hacking attempts. Basically, you know, uh, collect data on what kind of attacks or payloads or patterns uh, that are being used, uh, which were uh, you know accessible to through their APIs that was publicly available, uh, which had all the kind, all, all kinds of data with respect to the uh, you know attack attacks payloads and bypasses. So we had a simple setup where you know we pulled uh, Sans Honeypot every fifteen minutes to check for new payloads or bypasses. Uh, and whenever uh, you know uh, uh, whenever we had a new bypass, we you know we were getting an alert to a Slack. You know, uh, and and this was uh, uh, so whenever uh, you know. We fetch our data, and this particular uh, data, like you know, for example, bypasses or payloads, uh, were uh, were sent to our WAF rule checker, which validates against our. And uh, uh, if if it passed our uh, you know WAF rule, uh, basically on uh, uh, considering this is a bypass or not, we were getting alerts to our Slack channel, which was then manually uh, reviewed and updated by our uh, security. So this helped uh, in looking at different payloads and bypasses uh, to you know to basically update. The and and talking about uh, uh, attack simulation. 
uh, with uh, with Honeypot and other uh, you know, defenses set. We also wanted uh, to internally run these payloads against our servers uh, to check uh, for any vulnerable uh, servers, basically to simulate attacks. Right. So uh, you know we had uh, we had a setup where you know we had one attack permission and our DNS server. Uh, basically, we were using candidate tokens uh, uh, to look for uh, responses or uh, feedbacks. We started, you know, sending out the payloads uh, to all of our subdomains as part of URL parameters, headers, and body of the request. So our, our DNS server would, you know, send an alert if there was a hit that it received. So basically, this is how it worked, and you know, we started uh, monitoring this uh, internally uh, to check for uh, our vulnerable servers and services that were present. So uh, moving on, I think uh, now our colleague uh, uh, Hasha is going to take over from uh, you know, uh, on, on other uh, protection uh, uh, um, or measures responses that we had. So over to you, Hasha. Thanks, Sujit. Uh, like Sujit explained, we had multiple layers of defenses put at the off layer to prevent our systems from getting exploited. Now let's go a little deep towards the application side. As a short term solution, one of the mitigation measures that we have done is to patch all our systems, uh, the workload the workloads, the deployments, cron jobs with this environmental variable log4j format misses no lookups whose value is set to true. Uh, like Libin mentioned in one of the previous slides, we make around 2000 uh, deployments per month. That's uh, a really very high value. And there's a very good chance that these environmental variables that we injected into the deployment manifest make it overridden. And freezing deployments is not something that we want to do. So to not affect the developer productivity and at the same time to ensure that these uh, applications are not vulnerable to this attack, we came up with a solution to uh, use the Kubernetes dynamic admission controllers. Now, just to give a rough idea on what these uh, admission controllers are, admission controller is nothing but a code that intercepts the request made to the Kubernetes API server. It sits between uh, the requester and the Kubernetes API server. And what exactly did this mutating admission controllers do is like the name says, whenever, whenever there is a mutate or an admit event, these controllers made sure that the objects are created with this environmental variable injected in them. So this diagram shows uh, how a request reaches the Kubernetes API server and where the admission controller code sits in and how it injects the environmental variables. So moving on to the long-term solutions, uh, one of the long-term solutions to ensure that the applications are not vulnerable to attack to this attack is to ensure obviously ensure that they are upgraded if they have vulnerable log4j dependencies now the interesting piece comes here log4 shell attack can be carried out even if the applications have third or fourth or ninth layer dependencies so how do we identify the applications that have direct or indirect log4j dependencies for this uh, we initially took the help of dependabot what is dependabot Dependabot is an OSS scanner that uh, compiles all OSS dependencies across the repositories in the organization. Uh, Dependabot helped us identify the vulnerable uh, log4j dependencies in our code. And initially, we made use of Dependabot to identify the applications that are log4 shell vulnerable. We also made use of SIFT. Uh, SIFT is an open source tool that helped us generate an spawn from the container images. So uh, basically, these two tools helped out uh, identifying log4j dependencies both in the application and the container images. Uh, there's an interesting thing that I would like to speak about here. Uh, that is ResetPay asset inventory. Uh, ResetPay asset inventory turned out to be our silver bullet in identifying production systems that are affected by this and, and that are vulnerable to this uh, log4j, log4shell attack. Uh, it helped us identify the container images, the applications, and the owners and the mappings between them. Uh, so we do have a tool that gave us information about all the assets in our company and the relations between them. Now, having such an inventory uh, in a company where there are hundreds of microservices and being able to quickly identify the owners helped us incredibly well in upgrading our systems as quickly as we can. Uh, and what exactly is this tool and what are these assets? If you're interested to know more about it, there's one more talk uh, from Satyaki and Sandesh uh, from ResorPay security team uh, who, who will be speaking about uh, the asset inventory project at ResorPay. You can follow the um, below link to, more, to, to know more about it. So uh, we put some uh, short-term solutions, to, we put some long-term solutions to prevent this attack. Are these defenses enough to stop the attack? No because we used many third party applications that we directly or indirectly uh, you run uh, that may use the vulnerable log4j versions 
for example we use looker neo4j redis labs and the problem is we do not have sufficient high level control over what the third party provider runs either on our systems or in their systems and for this the only solution we had is to keep track of the vendors the upstream providers and have back and forth communication with them to check if their systems are updated so they do not log any of this uh, log forshell attack payloads uh, our major provider aws also kept us posted uh, on how how they are, how they patched their systems and which of their services got affected because of this and third coming to the third party dependencies we made use of gripe which scans the contents of a container image to find known vulnerabilities in uh, some of the major operating systems and also to find vulnerabilities in vulnerabilities in language specific packages you can you can go to the next slides so what next we had plans for prevention the next important thing that comes into the picture is monitoring monitoring the egress traffic and how we exactly went about monitoring uh, during the log4j time i'm going to explain now uh, we gathered a threat list of ips from various sources like sans and crowds crowdsec and we closely monitored if any of our systems are interacting with the threat list of ips uh for this since uh, since we are uh, mostly the folks on aws we took the help of aws uh, detectives ip address analytics uh, uh to to figure out whether there is any interaction from any of our systems with the threat list of ips as you must already have known uh, that the detective takes its feeds from vpc flow logs and uh, uh, cloud trail events it helped us determine if there are any events of interaction uh, with the gathered list of ips we ensured we also ensured that uh, this gathered list of ips is continuously updated with some custom scripts you can go to the next slide so what went well for us having an asset inventory bombs services and other in front making use of them to quickly identify the application owners and uh, upgrade, upgrading the applications in a war front mode uh, really turned out to be a silver bullet for us our defense in depth mechanism also uh, helped us uh, in reducing the attack surface our web application firewall uh, was the first layer that is a first layer of defense that we have put blocked a ton of uh, log4j payloads from entering our systems the next thing we deployed all, uh, we, we patched all our deployments uh, so that with the environment variable so that they do not make the jndl lookups next we upgraded each of the uh, applications that have dependencies on vulnerable log4j versions and finally having custom built waf rules that can understand the business context also proved out to be very helpful for us as our firewall rules man uh, managed to block more attack traffic than some of the uh, managed waf rules provided waf rules provided by the third parties thanks thanks uh, libin suchit and shri harsha um, for for an amazing discussion around this i think i was um, the point around the asset uh, you know the software asset in inventory which is generally not very exciting for uh, security folks turns out to be a real key element during these times so that was a great message in, in that one of the things that uh, i was thinking when listening to your talk was also you know those couple of weeks and what a roller coaster that was uh, and of course also some of the months that followed after that uh, but this is quite ingenious so i i am pretty excited about this topic and i love the session i had a couple of questions myself maybe i'll start with one of those um, one question i had was you were talking about how many assets right so you started looking at how many assets were impacted um i was thinking what can you do about the infrastructure components that are affected uh where there may be dependency for example on a third party to upgrade their uh, infrastructure components how did you tackle that or what do you think is the best way to tackle that in such a scenario uh, sandesh we want to take this question uh sure uh, so hey nilu um i i i work with uh, suchit dharsha as well in the raise pay team um, so yeah so that was a much longer drawn out process than um, than fixing our own systems um i think it didn't take us so one it was not always clear if log4j was used by all our third parties uh, we knew which of them kind of used java and which didn't etc so we had a fair idea if they'll be relevant or not we we then had to reach out um, to our vendors to figure out if they're using um uh, log4j or not and then figure out if there's an update path etc some vendors i must say were extremely proactive uh, they actually sent us things even before we asked them uh, right so which was great even when we were doing this file we had some vendors reach out and say hey here's you know our versions are vulnerable here's what you need to do upgrade and in the meantime here's what you can do to stop so that was great uh, but with with especially one or two vendors i don't want to kind of name anyone it was a long drawn out 
battle process, uh, right? Uh, and I think one thing we kind of realized, you know, this kind of goes back to like security hygiene in general, is that if you're using older versions of a particular product, right, and then you haven't upgraded because of other reasons, for regression reasons or whatever it is, this is when, and, and something like LockForge happened, that's when it comes to really biting, right? Because now you don't want to upgrade to the latest version because, you know, it'll break a bunch of stuff. But at the same time, you can't not upgrade because it's vulnerable to log you. So this was a good lesson for us on um, you know um, why certain you know why we need to upgrade. We need to have better patch hygiene and better update hygiene as well. By and large, I think we were okay. Uh, it was a long drawn out process, but it was fine. But there were definitely one or two instances where um, I know I know Harsha is smiling because he did with some of them. Uh, you know, he it went on for a really long. Time. You know, we were holding our breaths and the WAF rules and everything. Else. Yeah, I think as a security team, uh, I mean, I would like to add that you also grow with the vulnerability, right? So that that time when <laughs> the vulnerability was uh, adapting uh, and yeah. for 2.16, again, they had another issue, then we went ahead and patched that as yeah. well. So you grow and you you grow to get that patience as well, uh, gradually. You grow old, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. True, true. Good point. Um, one, uh, another question while we are getting some of the other questions was, I was thinking of, so we heard a lot about what security teams can do right and uh, i think a lot of these uh, including some of the alternate controls that we could use for the vulnerability that could be applied uh, there are solutions like waf and other things which you have clearly called out uh, looking back is there one thing that you could uh, tell the developers maybe all the developers or audience that are watching us what can they do to be prepared for zero days like this yeah, if Libin was here, he would have answered this because this is kind of part of his daily job here. Uh, but he had to kind of step out for a, a, a personal emergency. So yeah, so I, I think for, from a developer's perspective, I think there are a few things, right? Uh, but at least within Razorpay, um, you know, we rely on um, you know open source scanning tools like Dependabot, and we also kind of we also use Gripe in, in multiple cases. So I mean, we have an SBOM which will basically tell you the list of all the dependencies you're using, and also tells you which of them are vulnerable, right? Now the problem with the current technology is to kind of you know it, it's not very clear if you're using the particular vulnerable package in a vulnerable library, right? So it sometimes it becomes hard to know whether you actually are vulnerable or not right um, but as hygiene if you can actually make sure that you know you are aware of what open source software you're using and make sure that you are upgraded to the latest version then that solves it but that's much easier said right? i mean it's very easy for us to say it but it's much harder to actually get it done so for us i mean from a security perspective what we how we help developers is at least make it very easy for them to know um, you know which of the repos have which vulnerabilities, like which open source you know, packages have, and, and we know where the instances are. Um, what would be really nice if we can somehow come up with technology or come up with ways of saying, hey, um, you know, you're using a particular li library which has a vulnerability in, say, function X, and since we are not calling that function, we don't have to worry about it. Or since we are calling it, you have to do it. So then the signal to noise ratio becomes much better. Um, but I don't know of a tool that does that very well. And I think doing it manually does not scale at there's a pain uh, right? So yeah, so at this point, if developers are watching, first of all, thank you for all the help. But more than that, um, you know, if you can if you can kind of uh, you know um, make sure that you know if your security team already has an S bomb and an open source kind of use that. If not, there are plenty of open source tools available like um, you know, Gripe, uh, um, um, Gripe from, from, I think I forget the name of the company, uh, but also OWASP dependency scanner from OWASP. Uh, there are a few open source tools which do it. So you can run a scan, get a list of all your vulnerable dependencies and make sure it's upgraded. That's cool. If you can integrate that with your CI CD pipeline, you can do that. Yeah, even that first stage to get that visibility, right? That itself is can be a struggle where you don't have um, this very much organized and, and stuff like that and having automation around dependency i think these two things will make life everyone's life much easier so yeah. that's great message there thanks thanks sandesh so thanks a lot uh, to uh, uh, to all our speakers for the sessions today uh, this marks the end of a three-part series on risk assessment and mitigation with razor pay